and welcome to Trucks. On tonight's show, Brian will be taking a look at a rather unusual commercial van, the Mitsubishi Shogun for work. Also, Tim will be taking a look at another big rig and we'll be solving your problems in Trucker's Gripes. Tonight, we're celebrating the 36th birthday of what has become renowned as the big daddy of all commercial vans over the last four decades. A UK bestseller, it's named synonymous with vans. In fact, you could say it's become the generic term for every van that's followed. You guessed it, the Ford Transit. And we're here at its birthplace in Southampton to look at its development and production since its birth in 1965. The Transit Factory is one of Europe's most modern van plants and has recently benefited from a £250 million investment. Ford employ 1,500 employees at this plant and produce 18,000 units annually for export to 18 countries. Now we see many factories throughout our series of trucks, but the Southampton factory is purely an assembly plant. That means that Ford don't manufacture any parts here, they're all brought in from suppliers. Transit was originally codenamed Project Redcap and replaced Ford's 307E van in 1965. The manufacturing process starts in A building. The main body is constructed here and incorporates the side members, the underbody, the body sides, framing and roof installations. Progress throughout the body shop is constantly monitored by a fully automatic computerised scheduling system using a series of barcodes, lasers and readers. This is so that the various components that make up the different transit specifications can be clearly identified so that the right part is delivered at the right place at the right time. The main body construction line is 100 metres long and is equipped with 38 robots carrying out 3,800 welding operations. The body is transported around the factory on ski bars along tracks because it doesn't have a chassis with wheels at this stage. So there are two types of jigs, one for the short wheelbase, one for the medium wheelbase. These help locate the body and prepare it for the spot welding. the roof is loaded. Then the body shell goes through a process of 35 robots delivering 1,400 welding operations to produce the complete transit body. The next stage is to prepare the shell for painting. The body is clean and sent through a complex electrolysis process. It's then coated prevent it from rusting throughout its hard life. It's then finally painted with an undercoat, a top coat, and then it's baked in the oven. And that's it for this section of the manufacturing process. But join us later in the programme when we'll be taking a look at how the electronics and interior trim are fitted. But now it's time for Brian, our resident van man, with his truck test. And this week he's taking a look at the Mitsubishi Shogun for work. So, you think commercial vehicles are boring, no street cred? Think again. So we have a Mitsubishi Shogun 2.5 turbo diesel. Now this has got a lot of street cred. Look at the machinery. Let's go and road test it, shall we? Uh, 
as you'd expect from one of these vehicles, the trim level and quality in the front cabin here is perfect. We've got plastic, wooden trim, all the controls are easy to get to, everything that you want is here. And with a 2.5 turbo diesel engine in this, it's got quite a bit of pull in it. Now they also do a 1.8, and you can, that's the petrol version, and you can go right up to three and a half litre. That's on a diesel. Now the turbo, there's a lot of performance, a lot of pull. Now fuel consumption of something like this is only going to give you urban cycle of about 21 to the gallon. So it's not a lot, especially on the big three and a half litre. Now this 2.5 will give you around about 30, which is a little bit better. Feels a pretty practical commercial vehicle. It's got plenty of ground clearance for driving off-road. The only thing is though, with a price tag, which is up in the 20,000 bracket, it makes it quite an expensive commercial vehicle when you consider this thing will only carry half a ton. Now the one thing with this is the service intervals are four and a half thousand miles or six months. Now, remembering if this is a commercial vehicle, there's every chance you're going to be doing more than four and a half thousand miles in six months. So it could have tend to be off the road more than it's on. Also, the cost of the servicing needs to be taken into account. So, it drives like any four-wheel drive showgun you'd expect to drive. Absolutely brilliant, nice interior. But, is it a practical commercial vehicle? Let's have a look in the back. Practical or unpractical? Now, this is a good load area in here. They do supply a heavy duty matching for this. Why don't they fit it? They also supply a cage to fit at the top. Why don't they fit it? Now, inside here is a load of plastic all over the place. Builders, electricians, it's going to last a week. It's going to get ruined with stuff being thrown in there. Lovely big bumper at the back here. Now that's solid plastic, stuff sliding in and out, it's going to get scratched, it's going to get split, it's going to get damaged. This back will also take a UK pallet, but seriously, would you let a forklift truck come up to the back of that? If you would, best of luck to you. Performance figures on this particular vehicle, 190 Newton meters at 3,500 RPM. It's not a bad bit of torque. This particular vehicle will tow 5,500 kilos, and with that torque, we'll pull it very convincingly. Fuel consumption, now on this particular vehicle, 2.5 diesel, 32.1 urban cycle. On the bigger one, the 3.5 litre, then you're going to get about 21.7. Not bad. We've looked around the vehicle, we've road tested the vehicle, so what do we really think of it? It is a good practical four-wheel drive, but with such a small payload, is it a practical commercial vehicle? Now it definitely has a niche market, niche market being surveyors, camera crews, anybody that has an engineering job that they need to go across country to. But at £16,500 plus the vodka and tonic, that's VAT at 17.5% to you and the VAT man. With the little extras you need inside to make the load secure, it comes out to about 20 grand. Does that make this an expensive or inexpensive commercial vehicle? You decide. So the Shogun's great if you're an off-roading tree surgeon, but not so good for heavy-duty commercial use. Now earlier on in the show, we were here at the Trousnip factory in Southampton, taking a look at the production process of producing a body shell. But we move on, and now it's time to take a look at how they fit the electronics and the trim to the vans. The completely painted bodies are then transferred from the paint shop to B building by an elevated tunnel in the roof. And that's for pre-fitting. That's for things like steering wheel, dashboard and doors. Twenty years ago, 4,000 manual workers would have worked on the factory floor. Today there are 1,400 workers and in excess of 150 robots. The first millionth transit van was built in Europe and came off the line in 1976. Working shift times have changed over the years. No more day and night shifts, closing the plant down at the end of a shift and starting it up again at the beginning of the next. So it's more cost effective with more continuity. The doors 
are removed and trimmed from the main vehicle. Then they are replaced and refitted exactly to the same vehicle using the barcode system. This is referred to as the doors on off process. At this stage, just the basic interior trim is fitted, such as the steering column and the outlying dashboard. All the other fixtures, such as the seats, are fitted further on down the line. Now, many of us might know how difficult it is to put a new window into a house, but have you ever thought of putting a windscreen into a van? Thankfully, I won't be trying my hands at window fitting because they've got robots here. And what's happened is, is the robot picks up the window screen using its arm and a suction pad. And then the transits are rolled over one by one. Then what happens is the robot places the window screen into the correct position. And this is fixed using an adhesive. And this is kept at a constant temperature via the infrared light from above. Gentle giant robot. In the year 2000, Ford spent over £414 million on research and engineering in Britain. So, we've seen about three quarters of the production process. But I don't know if you've noticed we missed some of the vital components such as the engine, the gearbox and the wheels. But join me after the break when we're finally seeing a complete transit roll off the production line. And don't forget your truck test, we're looking forward to that with that big rigger. And also we'll be addressing your problems in Trucker's Gripes. Hello and welcome back to Trucks. Later on in the show we'll be seeing a completed transit roll off the production line. But first, it's over to Tim to see how he got on with this week's truck test. In the last series, you might remember, we visited the Daft factory in Leyland and saw the trucks being assembled. And in fact, we actually drove an LF off the line. But the one thing we didn't manage to do is actually road test one. Well, today, we're going to put all that right. The LF series is Daft's replacement for one of the best-selling 7.5 tonners in the UK, the Roadrunner. This vehicle was consistently in the top three throughout its long life, I think that was for over 15 years. There is no doubt it's style for the 21st century. With sweeping modern curves and distinctive design, it certainly helps create the right image. Well, the LF is a bit of a hybrid, but in the nicest possible way. First of all, have a look at the cab. Does it look familiar to you? It should do. The cab's actually made by Renault in France for DAF, and they use this for the Midland range. And then there's the engine. It's actually a Cummins engine, but shares a lot of the basic design with the Aveco Tector engine. So it's quite an interesting mix of parts. But that's not unusual in this day of badge engineering. The key is, how does it drive? This is only about the second or third time I've actually been inside an LF and I must admit I'm impressed. The fit and finish looks high quality and I do like the, the, uh, the blue and the grey interior. It's a really nice mix and certainly if we were trying to score it on first impressions I'd give it certainly 9, 9.5 out of 10. You've also got to realise this is quite a competitive market. This is seven and a half tonners. People that are driving these are, in the main, people that drive cars. So you've got to get 
drive-like quality, or certainly car-like quality. Um, we've got this with the LF, I must admit, I'm very impressed by it. First of all, you've got a nice set of controls, very, very handy indeed. You've got, first of all, for instance, you've got a nice gearbox, it's a ZF five-speed gearbox, and it's probably one of the best gearboxes around. Max to that is, for this vehicle, we've got the 170 brake horsepower engine, which again is the, the largest you can get on the 45 at seven and a half tons. It is very quiet. You know you get this whining from typical Euro 3 engine, the small engine, 3R, 4 litre engines. Uh, you do hear a little bit of that, but as far as the ambient noise inside the cab is really low. The LF45 170 has a gross vehicle weight of 7,500 kilograms. The engine, although designed by Cummins, is designated as a Packard 3.9 litre Euro 3 engine. This is rated at 167 brake horsepower at 2500 RPM and it has a maximum torque of 600 Nm between 1200 and 1600 RPM. This is matched to a ZF 5 speed gearbox and it has an unladen weight of just over 3000 kilograms. So as we've seen, the LF definitely does live up to its first class parentage. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, it's even better. So we have no doubt that this vehicle will be in the top three 7.5 tonners for many years to come. I don't know, Tim gets to have all the fun. Who knows when I'm gonna get the chance to do it? Anyway, it's over to you and what's on your minds in Trucker's Gripes. But be sure to stay with us to see what happens at the end of the production line. Driving up and down the country up to 15 hours a day often means a pit stop and sometimes an overnight is necessary for rest, food and the usual bodily functions. So how do you rate the quality of the British motorway services? And do you have any complaints, sir? For transport wagons, no good at all. Too expensive. No room for parking. Just not a very nice place to be. I would say the biggest complaint that I have is, is having to pay to park the vehicle uh, on a night when a driver's done 15 hour shifts. Um, it then parks uh, for the evening or, or what he's got to do when he's got to pay for that facility. Standards are definitely slipping and the price of food and goods is high, but we are told that we should appreciate it costs a business more to remain open 24 hours a day. Staff have to be employed and utilities such as gas, electricity paid for. And who wants to leave the motorway and drive around for hours looking for a toilet? But are these reasonable excuses or lame attempts to disguise poor standards? To find out, we asked you how our services compared to those abroad. They don't. They're free for a start off, they're a lot bigger, a lot more cleaner. The food's better. Well, no, they're just set out better. Like on the continent, there's special facilities for every goods drivers. Um, it's the law over in, in Europe, they've got um, their own, you know, shower blocks, um, TV facilities, washrooms, and probably a little cafe, which is probably a bit subsidised. Because at the end of the day, it's these things that, that make that uh, turn the industry of growth in itself. So compared to European service stations, our truck drivers are forced to settle for second best in the UK. British services lack a reasonable price quality restaurant, clean warm showers and free truck parking. We don't live in an ideal world and most things come at a price, but clean toilets that smell nice and a decent meal isn't a lot to ask for. So pay attention, little chef, motto and welcome break, because our boys have a gripe and a national boycott of your services by commercial vehicle drivers would be a damaging effect on your business. I hope we've aired some of your problems. Now back here in Southampton, we've come to the final stages in the production. All that remains is to fit the final trim and mechanics. The C building houses the final assembly line where major mechanical components are carried to a constantly moving merry-go-round of fully trimmed bodies using moon buggies. Now there are two moon buggies for every transit, one for the engine and one for the front and rear axles. There are 280 transits built a year every day and the five wheels, that means there's 1,400 tyres to be inflated. Now I take it from me, the guy with the foot pump has got Olympic sized leg muscles. A 
at a price of anything between £10,000 and £20,000 each, and 280 vans produced every day, there's a lot of money involved in making vans. In the final assembly, the major mechanical components are matched to the fully trimmed bodies by a computer-controlled line broadcast system. Each vehicle is roller road tested and water leak tested before being checked for the correct operation of all electrical items. Then it's sent off to the buy-off area where it's presented for vehicle release. And this is the finished article. From here, the vehicles dispatch to Southampton docks for onward distribution to Ford's UK and European dealer network. And that's it for this week, but be sure to join us next week when Brian's testing the latest vans. And I'll be out on the road with another truck road test, and of course we'll have your trucker's gripes.